Commander Rick. For five years, my main obsession has been comics. I live in Arthur, Ontario, not the best place if you have a burning desire to enter the comic world. I just can't seem to find out how to get into the job I know I'm destined for. Will Marvel hire me right out of high school? Etc., etc., etc. Okay, welcome to Career Counseling for Comics and Speculative Fiction. Anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe has voted English only signs. Mm. 40,000 tons of death. Armed with PCBs blew up the ozone layer today. Standing by for solid rocket booster separation. Greetings, prisoners of gravity. This is Commander Rick. How do you make a career in comics or science fiction? Every writer and artist I know says, practice, practice, practice. But a few have more helpful hints. For example, Nancy Kress. She's an award-winning SF author, teaches writing at the State University of New York, and has a column in Writer's Digest magazine, which, if you're serious about writing, you already read. I teach a lot of young writers, and I'm always amazed that some of them have never seen a science fiction magazine. They want to write this, or they think they want to write it, but they've never read it. They don't know what is being done. And they come up, therefore, with ideas that they think are wonderful and fresh that actually have been played out 40 years ago. Read everything you can get your hands on, inside the field, outside the field. My second piece of advice would be persist. It's not easy, in most cases, for most people to get published. And it's especially not easy if you only write when you're in the mood. If you wanted to be a professional basketball player, you wouldn't tell your coach, I'm sorry, I can't practice basketball today, I'm not in the mood. And yet a lot of writers think, young writers think that they can only write when inspiration strikes. This isn't true. You, you practice it and you work at it in the same way you would work at basketball and with the same kind of dedication. So often I'm asked what makes for bad science fiction or fantasy and the answer is really simple. Formula writing rather than uh, character driven type of writing and I, I tend to sound like a broken record but my, my background in writing while it's not academic is literary. I'm not an academic but I have been exposed to a wide variety of, of literary writing, of literate writing and I think that the same standards that make other writing readable also make speculative fiction readable. If people ignore those standards, if they produce wooden characters, if they introduce great gobs of exposition there are lovely examples. There's the Rod and Dawn dialogue, you know. Well, Rod, here we are on Mars. Yes, Dawn, and as you know, if we don't get to the Empress before 1400 hours, she's going to declare war on Earth. Yes, and meanwhile, the moon is falling into the Earth, and it's necessary to perform the following geophysical calculation in order, and then 14 pages later, Rod, you know, Dawn gets to say something else, you know. It, and this is the kind of stuff that gives it a bad name, but good writers do not write this kind of stuff because it makes their teeth hurt. So they have to write something about people, about actions that people take on, about the kind of multi-level events that happen to us every day. Lou, any advice for the aspiring young writer? Yeah, basically, don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's true, this is, this is something Harlan Ellison tends to to tell people who are trying to write. Uh, if, it's, if someone can be at all discouraged from doing it, then they should be. Uh, if, if you can listen to me telling you not to do it and you insist on doing it anyway, then, then maybe you've got a chance. There are so many discouraging things that happen along the way. Um, I started writing when I was about four or five. My parents taught me to read when I was three. And I started submitting to magazines when I was 13. And I was 27 when I sold my first story. Uh, along the way, and even after I started selling stories, all kinds of horrible things have happened. Uh, it's a tremendously discouraging business. People don't value individual vision in it. They value just the number of copies sold. And um, there's not a lot of money in it. 
there's a lot of, of, of grief and, 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 and heartache and stuff like that. The best thing in terms of practical advice I can tell anybody is to get a day job that they can do part-time that they don't hate. It allows you to not have to compromise your work for the sake of sales. And uh, that's the best way I know to really get somewhere in the long term is to be able to do work you really care about. You buy yourself that freedom when you've got a day job that's, uh, that's comfortable that say you can do at home. What I did is I maneuvered myself over the course of several years to where I could do computer programming at home mm -hmm. and uh, basically mail in the programs these people in Dallas that I was working for. It gave me freedom of movement. Mm -hmm. I could set my own hours. Um, I could make enough money that whatever sales I made would, uh, would get me through. And that was very crucial to me. Uh, that, that, that bought me a lot, of, a lot of freedom and allowed me to, to get very um, solidified in, uh, in doing my own work. As well as writing, both Lewis and Candace have edited anthologies of science fiction. It's given them a, a wider perspective on writing, and that's important. You gotta remember there are huge markets for science fiction outside of North America. Over in the UK, Kathy Gale, the science fiction editor for the feminist publishing house, The Women's Press, has edited books by Americans like Lisa Tuttle and Joanna Ross. It sounds, I'm always accused of, of patronizing writers and teaching, treating them as if they're children, but always, always submit professionally. Um, and you'd be amazed, amazed at the numbers of authors who actually don't do that, who sort of send in. I've had people sending me fax paper sort of curled up saying that they can't, you know, they can't print it off or, or whatever. Um, and uh, people try the most amazing gimmicks to get themselves into print, which just makes the editor feel uneasy, really. Um, so it's just really important to present material professionally um, uh, and submit it to one or two publishers or one or two agents and uh, keep, keep going, keep trying, I think. And one of the real keys is to, is to realise that, that writing is actually partly talent, but also it's a skill that you learn so that, you know, the first book or the second book or the third book may not be good enough, but the fourth or the fifth or the sixth might. Um, I think there's a myth that, that writing is all about talent and if you're talented you can just rush off the great novel immediately. Um, and actually that's not true, it's about hard graft. What do editors want? They'll actually tell you, check out the writer's market or the writer's handbook. Also check out the trade magazines Locus and SF Chronicle. They have up-to-date information on SF book publishers, details about upcoming anthologies, and they'll tell you what the magazines are currently looking for. And study the story introductions that editors write for their anthologies. They often let slip why a story caught their eye. In the introduction to the story Down and Out in the Year 2000, the editor, Orson Scott Card, praised the author for keeping up the science fiction tradition of the primacy of event over character. But the story follows the mundane events in the life of an unemployed black man. It's all character. So I called the author, Kim Stanley Robinson, and asked whether writers should follow Card's advice on the primacy of event over character. 